is video 215, Vital Considerations for a Model Train Layout. When embarking on the journey of building a model train layout, or railroad, or railway, as you prefer, there are numerous factors to take into account. Please like and subscribe to Farland Howe. Among these, given the available space, the size of your curves holds significant importance. I've previously stressed the need to keep your grades, or inclines, declines, to less than 2.5 to 3%. Now let's delve into the crucial aspect of making your curves as large as possible. For instance, taking a look at the actual real-life full-size railroads, in North America, equipment for unlimited interchange between railway companies is built to accommodate for a 288-foot, 87.8-meter radius. But normally, a 410-foot, 125-meter radius is used as a minimum. As some freight carriages, freight cars, are handled by special agreement between railways that cannot take the sharper curvature, for handling long freight trains, a minimum 574-foot, 175-meter radius is preferred. This information from Wikipedia, Minimum Railway Curve Radius. I'll have a link in the description if you want to read the article. To translate that into model railway terms, 288 feet becomes 3 feet 3 and 3 quarter inches, or 1.09 meters in HO scale. I didn't calculate this for any other scale. It's pretty easy, though. You just divide the prototypical number by your scale. If it's HO, it's 87. If it's double O, it's 76.2, or in double O, you could multiply by millimeters since it's four millimeters to the foot. 410 feet, which is a normal curve radius, becomes four feet, eight and a half inches, or 56.5 inches, or 1.436 meters in HO scale. I did not calculate 574 feet. So if we say four foot eight and a half inches, 56 and a half inches, that's huge on a model railway. That curve wouldn't fit across a four foot four by eight sheet of plywood. That's for radius. For diameter, you've got to double that number. So these are huge numbers. Achieving prototypical curves on your model train layout requires a minimum curve radius in the range of three to four feet, six to eight feet in diameter. This is a considerable space requirement. While few may have such a large area available, it's possible to incorporate a curve of this size in a strategic spot on your layout. In other words, one curve, allowing you to capture trains in a prototypical curve for photography and video. It doesn't need to go in a circle or even 90 degrees of a circle. Any curve segment will really do for this purpose. So all your curves wouldn't have to comply with this, but if you had one curve, prototypical curvature, you could use that to photograph trains and video trains and that curve. Okay, I think we've talked about curve radius. As big a curve as is possible is the best solution here. Track plans. Let's talk about track plans. The next thing that needs to be said in our discussion is the importance of planning. If you don't like planning or are not good at it, as an alternative, you could use a tried and true layout out of a book or magazine instead of planning your own. In fact, I would recommend it. Many layout books are available, and one could help you solve your layout needs. These are usually layouts that have been built more than once, and the kinks are already ironed out. There are also layouts pre-designed that are good for operating. Operating is popular on American-style layouts. This is where you get folks together on your layout to run trains like a real railroad. That type of layout, however, was never really a consideration for me personally.
If you decide to design your own layout, whether it is done with pencil and paper or on a computer with one of the many track planning software suites available, plan, plan, plan. This is something you will not regret doing. It is easy enough to box yourself into a poorly planned layout, even with considerable planning. Without it, you will create a wreck at great expense. It will not be fun to run. It will be frustrating and embarrassing. Without planning and attention to basic railroad engineering, trains will derail, cars will come uncoupled, trains will stall, and you will wish you had never tried the whole mess in the first place. Don't let yourself go down that path. The satisfaction you'll gain from taking your time and planning is very much worth it. I am the most impatient person I know. Getting trains running was very important while building F2. I could barely stand it, and I had to go without it for five to six months, which just about killed me. The shortest radius curves on Farland 2, F2, are 22 and 5 eighths inches. To sum up, few can have scale prototypical curves, so make yours as large as possible. The shortest curves on Farland 2, F2, are 22 and 5 eighths. There was a Farland 1. All the rest of them are larger. However, they are nowhere near prototypical sized. In this configuration, I don't have room for anything much bigger, even though my room is 21 feet by 22 feet. There are folks out there who do have the room, but they are few and far between. The satisfaction you will gain from taking your time and planning is very much worth it. And I am the most impatient guy I know. Getting trains running was very important to me while building F2. I could barely stand it and had to go without running trains for five to six months. It nearly killed me. Using my own experience planning F2 as a guide, let me say that I spent more than three months working on track plans before I did any carpentry. As you can see, I went through many iterations to get where I ended up. You will note that in the beginning there were a number of things I thought I must include. Eventually I realized many of them were things it would be nice to have if I had more room, like a fiddle yard. It's a trade-off. Most people can't have everything. The whole concept of a helix and a lower level had not entered my radar screen in those days. Many people do have them. When it finally crossed my mind, it was very late in the planning. I decided against one because I worried about the long inclining curves needed and how well my trains would manage going up and down the helix. I have heard many folks say they were unhappy with their helixes even now. Some say they hate them. It takes at least 16 feet to go up or down 4 inches on a straight track. To work well, a helix needs to be really big so that the curves are gentle and the grades are shallow. They take up a large amount of space and are non-scenic spaces where you cannot watch your trains run very well. It takes a lot of time for a train to traverse them, too. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm saying they can be good if done correctly. As an illustration of planning a model railway, let me describe the various ideas I had when planning F2 and why I decided on the direction I took. Eventually in my design explorations, I realized I did not want to duck under the track to get into the layout. And I didn't want a gate or removable entrance section. Those kinds of things can cause problems with track alignment and I didn't want problems. I had all of that with Farland 1, or F1. I wanted to be able to walk into the layout to work on it, run it, or have visitors walk in. It makes it so much more friendly for people to see up close all the meticulous effort I have put into it. Another thing that comes to mind when thinking about design considerations for F2 is that when running and shooting a video on Farland 1, I didn't like how the flat back scenes or backgrounds looked in the videos. I didn't like the shallow buildings pushed up against the back scenes either. 
I put great effort into giving depth to my vaccines backgrounds at the time, but I was never satisfied with the way they looked, particularly in video. In F2, I adopted the concept of using the layout as the background. You will usually see the layout in the background when you watch videos of train running on this layout. To do this, I used height. For instance, you can see that the town portion of Howe Street section is higher in the middle and slopes on both sides to the track level. This allows cameras to see the scenes above and behind the action, not a flat photo of painted sky. I do use sky blue painted walls and painted clouds, but it is above the scenery and on the horizon, and usually is just a very narrow band at the top of the frame, as it is in nature. The rural area is higher, as can be seen. If I shoot across far more, the rural area is higher, as can be seen. If I shoot across far more, this allows the layout to have its own back scenes there, too. The layout was intentionally built this way. I tried to imagine camera angles as I constructed and designed it. You can find many more examples of the layout being its own back scene if you look back at some of my running videos, or in the next running session. I'm not trying to say this is what you should do. I'm just explaining what planning can do for you in a future layout. To illustrate my own adventure in trying to come up with a design for Farland 2 that would satisfy as many of my desires as possible, uh, by way of illustration, here is a partial screenshot of the designs as I evolved through experimental looks at various concepts. This was the end game for Farland 1. It was pretty good, except there there was an area right in here that always caused problems. These two curves were too small. I won't go into it now, but this layout got changed a lot because it didn't work. And in the end, I gave up and had to tear it down and rebuild it because I didn't know what I was doing. But this was the final design for Farland 1. Some of you probably remember it clearly. So I just, I started designing Farland 2. I wanted a long runs, I wanted maximum flexibility. I wanted lots of things, good yard, goods yards, many tracks, lots of trains running at the same time, and on and on. This was my first stab. I started fleshing it out. But that whole process, if you understand design, you understand that that whole process allows you to think about what you're doing. It may seem tedious, and sometimes it is, but for the most part, it gives you a chance to really think about what you're doing. And that's the beauty of design before you build. Note that this was plan 5B. In other words, I'd gone through five major revisions and A, you know, 3A, 3B, 3C, 3D. I didn't get all the way to X, obviously, but, you know, I may have gotten to C, certainly on most of them. Anyway, this is plan 5B, and I really wanted everything. I wanted a, a Y so that I could turn trains around. I also realized access was a problem, so I started cutting out uh, operating wells. As I thought through that, I thought, oh my, I'm going to be climbing around underneath this thing all the time. Then I experimented with nested loops, plan 8C. There must have been uh, at least A and B versions of this as well. Then finally on plan 17, I hit on something. I realized if I, by pushing the loop back, I could walk into it. That was revolutionary in my thinking. I know, you think, well, it's pretty obvious. Why didn't he think of it sooner? Well, you know, you just don't. You, I didn't know anything about designing a model railroad. I hadn't watched uh, M. Peter Earl or any of that other stuff out there. I just really didn't know much about it, as can happen to you if you're not careful. So anyway, this was a revolutionary idea in the design evolution of Farland 2. 
F2. Plan 17 was when that started. By 20, by Plan 20, it was starting to evolve into something that's eh, pretty close to what uh, I have now. There were, uh, I don't think I had evolved the idea of of having the decline down and the incline up, or vice versa, and having it on two separate elevations as it is now. It's four inches difference. Far more is four inches lower than um, the track. I'm just talking about the track, the, the tracks at Howe Street. Four inches difference or thereabouts. So that was plan 20. Uh, the final design stage, I thought was final anyway, was plan 20DB. By then, I had realized that I was going to have different levels. I knew where I was going up, where I was going down, and I had evolved the idea of the farm. The farm being over the top, so that I had a long tunnel. This, The tunnel as shown is quite a bit longer than what I wound up with, but the concept is there. Although far more is certainly not developed the way it turned out. I was searching for a way to have far more because I loved far more and I wanted far more on the layout. 20 Plan 20D version P. <laughs> By that time I'd come up with the idea of a harbor and the beach and how street was pretty evolved, castle ruins, the, the rural area, and the elevations were set at that point. 52 inches at its uh, for far more track level and the beach and 56 inches from floor level for the rest of the layout. House Street is at 56 inches and far more is at 52. Plan 20D version P. And then this is pretty much the final version as built. It doesn't include the tube train siding, which is a pretty recent addition, but it's pretty well fleshed out the way it is now. So that was my um, journey in designing what I have right now. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.